Hi, um, I wanted to follow up on the video from a couple days ago, um, reviewing Dika's lecture to talk about some of the stuff from today on October 3rd uh, about um, the second part of addiction. Um, first of all, general drug terminology. Um, we talked about uh, neurotransmitters and how they turn on receptors, agonists and antagonists. Um, additionally, we talked about um, two different types of metabotropic or G protein associated receptors. Um, so um, those are um, the, the receptors that are associated with a G stimulatory protein. Um, it has a few effects um, in terms of the cell's um, metabolism and gene expression, but also will open sodium channels and so become, are excitatory. And then that same neurotransmitter of dopamine at different postsynaptic cells will open D2 type dopamine, or not open, will turn on D2 type dopamine receptors, which then activate G inhibitory proteins. Those have different effects on the cell's metabolism and gene expression, but also open potassium channels and so are inhibitory. Um, in addition, we talked about um, indirect ways to, so instead of agonists and antagonists, you can also have drugs that block dopamine transporters or block other neurotransmitter transporters. And by doing that, that doesn't actually affect the receptors directly, but instead makes it so that there's more of the natural neurotransmitter. Um, amphetamine is a little bit interesting in that it not only prevents the removal of dopamine, but actually causes dopamine to start getting exported back out. We um, also then discussed um, the general um, effects of dopamine transporter blockers at increasing dopamine released from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens. Um, you should remember our three main dopamine projections, the substantia nigra to the striatum. Um, this is um, a complicated projection. Ian's going to work through some of the details when we talk about Parkinson's disease. For now, the main thing that you need to know is that dopamine causes increases in urges to move. Um, and then for the ventral tegmental area, there are two projections we're discussing. One is the projection to the nucleus accumbens, which is associated with pleasure. That's the main one for addiction from Dika's lecture and from today. And then the frontal lobes, which are going to come up when we're talking about ADHD, because they're, the VTA to frontal lobes um, is involved in attention. Um, the striatum projection is going to come up a few times um, in, Par in Parkinson's disease, like I said, but also um, when we talk about Tourette's syndrome. So, um, but in addition to cocaine and other drugs like that and its effect on pleasure directly, we talked about a more complicated set of interactions with enkephalin, and, and, uh, which is a natural opioid, and also morphine, which is uh, an artificial um, or plant-derived opioid that doesn't normally, isn't normally found in the brain. Um, so with um, enkephalin, um, oops. Um, with, um, enkephalin, um, and, uh, or, yeah, so with enkephalin, first of all, um, there are a couple things that it does. Um, one is that opioid enkephalin releasing neurons make this sort of interesting synaptic connection where they don't make a connection onto a dendrite or a cell body like we've been talking about so far, but instead they make a presynaptic connection, they make a connection onto another presynaptic terminal, in this case onto the terminal of a cell that is normally releasing GABA from the, um, uh, onto the VTA cell. And so the consequence of um, enkephalin or mor morphine here is going to be less GABA released and therefore less inhibition, so our VTA neuron starts firing more, and that leads to a feeling of high. Also, elsewhere in the nervous system, at the spinal cord, pain-sensitive sens pain neurons that collect pain information from the skin and other parts of the surface of the body bring that information in. That information then makes a synaptic connection onto um, uh, what's called projection neuron that carries the information to the brain and tells the brain that something painful is happening. The enkephalin releasing neurons in the spinal cord will cause a decrease in the 
glutamate that comes out at this connection and also will hyperpolarize or directly inhibit this projecting neuron. So that has a sort of double effect of preventing the brain from finding out about the pain that's happening out in the periphery. Um, so that's a sort of natural way to stop pain signals. Um, if somebody has morphine that they've consumed um, or other mu opioid agonists, then that will do the same thing, which is prevent the um, release of neurotransmitter and whatever neurotransmitter does get out um, is less effective because the receiving cell is hyperpolarized um, because these are G inhibitory associated channels. And as a result, this is going to lead to less um, pain sensation. So that is how um, um, opioid receptors or opioid agonists, whether it's natural agonists like enkephalin or um, external agonists like morphine, lead to decreases in pain and then also lead to increased feelings of pleasure. Um, in addition to the other stuff that I summarized from Dika's talk, she talked as well about um, measuring the amount of dopamine receptors in the nucleus accumbens of people who are addicted. And what we find is there are fewer um, um, dopamine receptors. And so that tells us that this prolonged overactivation from either cocaine or morphine or whatever it is um, of dopamine is leading to a removal of dopamine receptors. So a reuptake inhibitor leads to overactivation and removal of receptors. Um, an agonist will also similarly lead to overactivation and then prolonged use of an agonist, especially at moderate or high doses, will lead to removal of receptors. This means then that that same amount of agonist has fewer places to bind and is not going to be as effective. So our example for this was alcohol, which is an agonist for GABA receptors, and prolonged use of moderately high doses of alcohol will lead to removal of GABA receptors so that then when alcohol is consumed, there are less places for it to bind. And then if the alcohol is stopped, then there are withdrawal symptoms because the, the normal amount of inhibition that should be there in the brain is not there. Um, we'll return to this on Tuesday, but um, caffeine is an adenosine receptor antagonist. Um, sorry, agonist. No, antagonist. Yeah, caffeine is an adenosine receptor antagonist. And so um, a little bit of caffeine just leads to less activation of adenosine receptors. And since adenosine receptors make you tired, which is what we're going to be talking about on, on Tuesday um, before we get into Tourette's, um, caffeine will lead to less feelings of being tired. Um, actually, as a preview of what we're going to be talking about on Tuesday, if you remember way back from the beginning of the semester, I mentioned that sometimes glutamate is released along with ATP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate, and that ATP does not get taken back up into the neuron. Instead, it stays in the cerebral spinal fluid. But that ATP will spontaneously, over a few hours, lose its phosphates and become just plain adenosine. At that point, the adenosine starts binding to receptors, but it doesn't ever get cleared out of the cerebral spinal fluid. It just builds up higher and higher concentrations over the course of a day. It's not until you fall asleep that your cerebral spinal fluid circulation increases enough that the adenosine can be washed out. But if you have caffeine, then even though the adenosine levels might be elevated, the caffeine blocks the adenosine receptors, and so you don't notice the um, feeling of tiredness until the caffeine wears off. Um, so that's how caffeine and adenosine work. Um, but then if you consume too much caffeine of sort of, you know, three, five, six cups of coffee a day um, for several days. This upregulation is a slow process, just like this downregulation is a slow process. It takes many days. Um, many days of excess antagonist use will lead to the cells removing, uh, in, put, putting in more receptors, sorry, putting in more receptors to compensate for this decreased signal. And then the caffeine 
that same dose of caffeine isn't going to bind to um, as high a fraction of the receptors. You're going to get more inhibition coming in. And so you need either more caffeine to get the same sort of amount of staying awake um, or potentially even more unpleasant if you suddenly stop caffeine consumption, then that will lead to um, a really strong excess in adenosine signaling. One other thing that I want to be sure to mention now, and we'll also mention on Tuesday at the beginning of class when we talk just a little bit more about adenosine, is that for both of these, for the, um, for the agonists here, the antagonists, and actually the reuptake inhibitors, for all of these, these changes in neurotransmitter receptor numbers are reversible. So decreasing or stopping use of the drug has some immediate withdrawal effects, but removing or slowly tapering off the dose, or in some cases just sort of quitting immediately with the drug, um, will also lead to, um, over the period of a few weeks or months, a return to the normal number of neurotransmitter receptors. So these effects are also reversible. Um, we'll talk, we'll, we'll sort of review some of that and review adenosine next time before sort of finally getting into Tourette's syndrome and the aspects of the basal ganglia um, involved in urges to move that are uh, associated with that.